There is no evidence that past CO2 rise, current CO2 rise, or future CO2 rise has caused, is causing, or will cause global warming. I don't believe in man-made climate change because there is no evidence for it. There is no evidence at all from Earth's long climate history that carbon dioxide has ever determined global temperatures. While I can understand trying to find flaws in the evidence that supports a theory or putting up evidence to counter it, but to counter the thousands of pages of data published in hundreds of scientific journals by simply doing this, well, it's a bit weak to say the least. And claiming that all the evidence comes from computer models isn't much better. All of the alarm over CO2 was generated by speculative projections inside a questionable computer program. To find the evidence, you have to get away from the blogs, they're not going to show it, and look at the place where the research is written up, in scientific journals. So in this video, I'm going to show the evidence that's in the scientific literature, explained in very simple terms and answering just three key questions. What's the evidence that CO2 can cause global warming? What's the evidence that it's done that in the past? And what's the evidence that it's doing that now? And I promise no computer models are necessary and no references at all to the IPCC. That's because, contrary to popular belief, the evidence is not reliant on computer models and none of the research that answers these questions has been conducted by the IPCC. So let's start with the first question. What's the evidence that CO2 can cause global warming? In other words, the theory behind it all. I covered this in more detail in the first video of this series, so I'm going to keep it simple. It was way back in the 19th century that physicists discovered that carbon dioxide lets through short wavelength light, the kind that passes through our atmosphere, but traps longer wavelength heat radiation of the kind that would be reflected back into space. This experiment was done and can still be done in a laboratory. In 1896, Vante Arrhenius calculated that based on this simple principle of physics, higher levels of CO2 in the atmosphere would therefore block more outgoing radiation, and that would raise global temperatures. In the 1930s, Guy Stewart Callender showed that the radiation absorbed by CO2 was at different wavelengths to the radiation absorbed by another important greenhouse gas, water vapour. By the 1950s and 60s, rising CO2 levels suggested that a much warmer world would soon be inevitable. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than 6 billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. I know, the script for this school education film looks like something that could have been made in 2008. In fact, it was made in 1958, and it was based on the scientific conclusions of the time, conclusions that haven't changed. So that dispels the myth that the global warming scare, if you want to call it that, was dreamed up by Al Gore or the IPCC or the Club of Rome. It predates them all. Climatologists not only know that CO2 blocks outgoing heat through experiment, but they can also measure exactly how much. That's how they know that a doubling of CO2 from pre-industrial levels will lead to a rise in average global temperatures of about 1 degree centigrade. And all climate scientists accept the fact that water vapour is also a greenhouse gas. Again, this is basic physics, shown by experiment and measurable. The difference between water vapour and carbon dioxide is that when you put water vapour into the atmosphere, it doesn't stay there very long. The atmosphere can only hold so much water vapour at a given temperature, and any excess condenses and falls to the ground. Even if you manage to turn all the Earth's lakes and rivers into water vapour in a single day, it would simply condense and come crashing back to Earth. The only way to get the atmosphere to hold more water vapour is to warm it up. And that's what carbon dioxide does. When CO2 is put into the air, it doesn't fall straight back down again. About half of it dissolves in water and half stays in the atmosphere. It accumulates. That's why CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere have been steadily rising since the start of the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago. So CO2 warms the atmosphere and a warmer atmosphere holds more water vapour 
which increases temperatures further. The basic laws of physics tell us that the Earth will heat up in response to this extra energy, and the temperature will keep rising until the increased amount of energy radiated out matches the amount coming in, what's called equilibrium. The temperature will eventually stabilize at a higher level. What will that higher level be? Well, you can estimate it with computer models, sure, but you can also do it through other methods, including looking back at the effect CO2 had in the past. And these estimates show that for a doubling of CO2 concentrations, we should see a rise in global temperatures of between 2 and 4.5 degrees. Now that's all basic physics, but to see if this happens in practice, we need to go back over the geological record and answer the second question, what's the evidence CO2 has had an impact on global temperatures in the past? If basic physics is correct, then we should see a good correlation between temperatures and CO2 over the past 500 million years. Well, here's the data for temperatures, and here's the data for CO2 levels. Put them together, and you get a very clear... oh dear... Actually, no one expected to see a correlation between the two because, of course, we're missing the most important factor of them all, the sun. Well, they virtually ignore the sun as a factor of climate change. It, I mean, everybody knows that the sun is the main source of energy and it, it's only got a flicker and it has an effect on us. Tim Ball thinks he's talking about researchers here, but it's the climate science critics, the politicians, the bloggers and the amateurs who showcase this graph that completely ignores the role of the sun and it's the climate researchers who factor it in. Over the last 500 million years, solar output has been getting gradually stronger. Of course, on its own, it doesn't show any better correlation with global temperatures than carbon dioxide does on its own. But if the CO2 temperature link is correct, then when we factor in both CO2 and solar irradiance, which are the long-term drivers of climate, then we should get a very good correlation with global temperatures, and we do. And a third piece of evidence from our geological past are the so-called snowball earth conditions. Since the sun was much weaker than today during the Precambrian period, the cooled earth should have been almost entirely covered in ice, and it was several times. So what thawed it out? The only thing that changed during the snowball period was that CO2 levels rose dramatically through volcanic activity. The thawing of the planet fits perfectly with carbon dioxide's role as a powerful greenhouse gas. Over time, CO2 tends to get washed out of the atmosphere due to chemical weathering, becoming carbonates that fall to the sea floor and turn into carbonate rocks. But during Snowball Earth, for obvious reasons, that kind of weathering didn't happen, which is why CO2 would have accumulated in the atmosphere. And since those high levels of CO2 remained even after the Earth had thawed, the Earth kept warming until it became a hothouse, with coral reefs close to the poles. Yes, even with the sun about 6% weaker than it is today, but with carbon dioxide levels 25 times higher, the Earth was much hotter than today. This anomaly is our fourth piece of evidence that carbon dioxide is a powerful greenhouse gas. Over millions of years, carbon dioxide weathered out of the atmosphere, and as levels dropped, so did the temperature. The Earth became a snowball once again, and the process repeated itself. Carbon dioxide's role in regulating past temperature is so clear that CO2 has been called the Earth's thermostat. So when I hear the argument, the climate's always changed, and this is perfectly natural, and that the climate change going on now is perfectly natural, well, of course it is. There's absolutely no difference between the CO2 that's being added to the atmosphere now and the CO2 that was added to the atmosphere in the past. It's the same stuff, and its warming effect on the atmosphere is exactly the same. Coming to the more recent past, there's the evidence that higher levels of carbon dioxide helped end recent glaciations. Climatologists agree that the amount of forcing from the Earth's changing orbit, thought to be the initial trigger for deglaciation, had nowhere near enough energy to thaw ice covering a large portion of the planet. I covered this in my video, The 800-Year Lag Unraveled. So before you start claiming that CO2 only lags temperature changes, please take a look at the scientific research that I cite in that video. 
So we've now seen how basic physics tells us that increasing levels of CO2 should warm the Earth, and we've seen that this has been observed throughout the Phanerozoic, the last 500 million years, and we've seen how a hothouse Earth and the thawing of a frozen Earth are consistent with CO2 as a powerful greenhouse gas. So if it should happen in theory, and it has happened in practice, then there's no reason to suppose CO2 has reformed its behaviour just because it comes from the burning of fossil fuels rather than volcanic activity. So is there any evidence that CO2 is causing global warming now? Back in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, of course, scientists saw no reason why CO2 should magically change its properties, and they predicted that as CO2 levels rose and aerosol pollution cleared, we'd start to see warming. And that's exactly what's happened. Over the last 35 years, the atmosphere has been warming, melting ice sheets and glaciers. Of course, not all the extra heat we're getting goes into the atmosphere. Most of it goes into the ocean. And recent research shows that the deep oceans are absorbing a lot of the heat at the expense of the atmosphere. So while there's still a debate among climatologists about exactly how this extra heat is being distributed, there's no doubt that there is extra heat coming into the system, just as scientists predicted. So where do the computer models come in? As I said, they weren't even around when the link between CO2 and global temperature was established. Most of the computer models I've seen are concerned with predicting the nature and the effects of future temperature rises, which I'll look at in another video on the consequences of global warming. But ironically, one part of climate science that's almost entirely reliant on computer models is a hypothesis that the critics embrace. Richard Linson's idea that as the Earth warms due to CO2, more cloud cover cools the Earth down again. So the Earth has a self-regulating temperature mechanism. Apart from the fact that most research shows that clouds have both a cooling and a warming effect, if there was some kind of self-regulating mechanism that stopped the Earth from overheating, we wouldn't see those wild swings in temperature in the past. In 12 minutes I've only scratched the surface of all the depth of all the evidence that's accumulated over the last hundred years. But on the three key questions I set out to answer, at least you now know what the basic evidence is without reliance on computer models or the IPCC. So to all those who don't accept the science, please don't respond with more predictable posts about how it's all an IPCC hoax, an attack scam, and computer models are wrong, or that this all started with the Club of Rome or Al Gore and they're all getting rich. Try to address the evidence. Explain why you think the experiments showing the radiation absorption of CO2 are flawed, and explain how the Earth thawed from its pre-Cambrian snowball, and explain why the Earth was much hotter than today during the Cambrian, even though solar output was much lower, and explain why there's a very good correlation between global temperatures and CO2 levels over the last 500 million years, and explain how the Earth warmed enough to emerge from recent glaciations, and explain why we've had 35 years of warming, even though solar irradiation has been lower. It's no good giving your feeling that CO2 isn't responsible, or that it's all a hoax, or Al Gore's getting rich, or CO2 always lags temperature change but never leads, or God is looking after the climate, or the sun did it. Making assertions is easy, but in science they have to be based on observations, not guesswork. You'll find a list of these internet myths in the video description, and references to where I've debunked them in previous videos. So take a look there first. But this inevitable question deserves an answer now, because it goes to the heart of what constitutes evidence. I explained the meaning of evidence in a scientific context in my video The Scientific Method Made Easy, and it's applied to all scientific theories, including greenhouse theory. Evidence is an observation, otherwise known in science as a fact, that's consistent with the theory. The more observations that are consistent, the stronger the theory becomes. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. Each piece of evidence in itself won't tell you much, but as more evidence is gathered, a picture emerges. Eventually, someone will produce a hypothesis as to what the picture is, and make a prediction that here, we'll see an eye. A successful prediction is the key to turning a hypothesis into a theory. Eventually, there'll be what's called an overwhelming preponderance of evidence supporting the theory, 
And another key test, no rival hypothesis even comes close to explaining all these observations. With just one or two pieces, you could hypothesize that the picture is a fire or a swan. But as more and more evidence comes in, it can only match one theory. Now, of course, there are still a lot of unknowns and problems and unanswered questions in greenhouse theory, just as there are in all scientific theories, because that's the nature of science. So just as with the theory of evolution, atomic theory, plate tectonic theory, and all the other theories, we have observations that fit the theory, and the theory fits nearly all our observations. To overturn a theory, you have to address the evidence, not just pretend it doesn't exist. OK, 50 years ago you could have done that, because while there was certainly evidence that CO2 had the potential to warm our planet, and that was very clear, there was not yet the evidence that it had done that in the past, or was doing it at the time. These predictions were based on carbon dioxide's basic energy-absorbing properties, and a calculation without computer models of what the obvious consequences of these properties would be. Of course, no one outside the scientific community took this seriously back in the 1950s. I guess the researchers of the time figured that people of the future would only take the science seriously when the ice really was melting and the glaciers really were retreating. That's us.